I'd like to talk a bit more today about uh, populations and population cycles and what limits population sizes. So last time we looked at the K-selected species and R-selected species. So a K-selected species is one that lives for a long time and has a few offspring. And R-selected species tend to be those that are short-lived and have a lot of offspring all at once. So the R-selected species probably have more of an unstable environment. So their populations grow very quickly. And so the regulation of a population size can be an abiotic variable. Some populations show very radical fluctuations over time and others remain stable. So population change can occur because density goes up or it can occur for other reasons. If population change is density independent, it means that the birth rate and death rate don't change with density, whether the density is high or low. But in density dependent populations, birth rates do fall and death rates can rise with population density. So we sometimes can find an equilibrium for population density. So in this case, uh, this is the birth rate or death rate per capita. And at this population density, the birth rate and death rates are the same. So this is what you would expect the density to be for a stable population size over time. As sometimes the death rate is constant. In this case, the death rate is constant. What changes, changes with density is the birth rate. So it, it could be that as density goes up, um, the organisms are more territorial and maybe aren't as likely to mate. And other cases, uh, the birth rate stays the same, but the death rate is dependent on density. The death rate goes up when the density goes up, usually because resources become more limited and there's more starvation in the population. So they're, uh, they're an example Density dependent birth and death rates are an example of negative feedback and that regulates population growth. Uh, they're affected by many different kinds of mechanisms. For example, competition for resources. In this case, these are uh, increasing seeds planted per meter squared. And this is the average number of seeds per reproducing individual. So when there's just a few seeds, um, the number of seeds, or sorry, when there's just a few plants planted there, the number of seeds is very high. When there are many plants planted per meter squared, well, this, the production of seeds gets to be very low. And so why might that be? What do plants uh, compete for in the soil? They compete for water, and they compete for nutrients. The more plants you have, the more nutrients and water are being used up by many plants. And plants need a lot of nutrients to produce seeds. So now with a high density of individuals, there just simply aren't enough nutrients available to produce seeds. Um, this is a case of the average clutch size. In other words, how many eggs birds have and the density of females. This is Mandarty Island again in BC. So the clutch size decreases with a number of females because again, food is in shorter supply. For birds, it takes a lot of food and energy to produce eggs. Territoriality can also limit density. For example, cheetahs. This cheetah is peeing on the tree. <laughs> and it's using this, its urine as a chemical communication to warn cheetahs away from its territory. So territoriality can limit density. Um, birds exhibit territoriality in nesting behavior. So the density of these birds is limited to the space that's available for them to nest. 
a population density can also influence the health and survival of organisms. For example, uh, pathogens can spread more rapidly. And one example of that in British Columbia are um, fish farms. Fish farms are an example where fishes are kept in uh, nets below water. So they, they have high densities of fish and they can increase the number of uh, sea lice that infect the farmed fish. And in some cases, the sea lice can escape outside the nets, and those lice may conceivably affect uh, other salmon species that are swimming nearby. may be affected by escaped lice. Um, I was in a group for a while called the Wild Salmon Circle. And for three years, we had uh, rallies and tried to increase awareness for fish farming so that we could um, get some fish farms off of the BC coast. They do, they do uh, cause some problems, fish farms. Atlantic fish are fished, sorry, Atlantic fish are raised in fish farms. So I stay away from Atlantic fish for that reason. Um, as prey population builds up, predators may switch and feed preferentially on that species. So that can also occur. Um, they consume a higher percentage of the individuals of a particular population. And toxic waste can also contribute to density dependent regulation of population size. So for example, um, in wine, as yeast populations increase, They accumulate um, alcohol during fermentation. So yeast, which is a single cell eukaryote in, in the fungus group, a uh, yeast gets its energy by fermentation, not by aerobic respiration. But yeast can only withstand a certain amount of alcohol. So the alcohol becomes toxic at a certain amount. For some pop populations, intrinsic or physiological factors appear to regulate population size. Uh, so for example, um, behavioral changes like aggression can replace breeding behavior. So high densities will contribute to higher death rates or, or a lower breeding rate. So the study of population dynamics focuses on interactions between biotic and abiotic variables. So things like aggressive behavior, territoriality, which are, is also a kind of behavior, abiotic variables like nutrients and water available, space available. So they cause a variation in population size. Some populations may be stable over time. Some may fluctuate over time. 
sometimes the fluctuation is quite um, pronounced. Often you need to have long-term population studies. So are, are large mammals relatively stable over time? That was thought for a while, but studying large animals over a long period. So these, for example, uh, the population dynamics of moose were studied between 1960 and 2000. And it shows that indeed there is quite a lot of fluctuation. This seems to be because of wolf predation. This seems to be because of a severe weather event. So large animals take a longer period of time to study their, whether or not they fluctuate. So extreme fluctuations usually occur uh, with invertebrates, small invertebrates. That is more common than in large mammals. So these are crabs, for example. Um, this is the commercial crab catch. That's how the crab population size is measured. And this is the year, this is 1950 to 1990. And there is considerable fluctuation in, in crab population size. Uh, what is the reason? Uh, well, one reason seems to be, one reason may be cannibalism. So as the crab population sizes get larger, they start to feed on each other because they're, they get to be quite easy to catch. But it may also depend on uh, ocean temperature. So they're in an intertidal regions usually. Well, not usually, sometimes, I guess. So there may be biotic factors like uh, cannibalism or there may be abiotic factors like ocean temperature. So a metapopulation are groups of populations linked by immigration and emigration. So not living sympatrically, but living in different areas. So there's an example of um, islands and areas off of the Haida Gwaii. So say, for example, you've got several islands here. And you have populations of, these are otters. And you have population of, let's say, sea urchins. Well, as it turns out, uh, the local um, native populations that lived on these islands eat both otters and sea urchins. And so I don't know if you've ever heard of a midden, but a midden is an, is an area of, of refuse, so garbage, essentially. And usually um, things are, are discarded of in the same area, so you end up getting layers of garbage. And it turns out that in some of these middens, there would be a layer of sea urchins. And then there would be a layer of otter bones. And there might be another layer of sea urchins. I'm simplifying this a little bit, but another layer of sea urchins, another layer of otter bones. So it turns out, for example, in, in this population here um, on this island, island number one, <laughs> that sea otters were, um, hunted and captured and eaten. And so the diet switched to sea urchins. But then eventually, because of this meta population, there are sea otters elsewhere. 
sea otters could move into the area. And then a few years later, there would be sea otters again in that area. So that is an example of um, populations being replaced through immigration. Another example can be seen here with, again, the Mandarti Island example. That must be a very well studied island. It shows here the number of breeding females on the y-axis, number of breeding females, and the year on the x-axis. What happened over time? On this one island, we see that this population of um, finch, it's a finch, dropped severely, probably because of a hard winter, and then went up again in population size. So it fluctuated considerably uh, between 1998 or 1988 and 1991. But there are other populations that exist on different islands, and the population of those individuals stayed about the same. They didn't really fluctuate very much because the individuals could move from island to island. Uh, keeping the population more stable overall. Some populations cycle in what's known as a boomer bust cycle. So the population grows significantly and then all of a sudden it drops. It grows and it drops. So one important thing to note when you're looking at graphs is be sure you look at the axes. So for example, this axis here shows the hare population here in numbers, hair population. And that's in black on the graph. That's the snowshoe hair. And the numbers are quite different than on the other side of this graph. And we have the number zero all the way to number 160. The other axis here, this, y, this side of the y axis, shows a lynx population. Here is the lynx, a beautiful animal. Here is the hare trying to escape. So the lynx are predators of hares. And this has been observed um, in the Yukon in Klawani Park. That's where a lot of research is done on the lynx hare uh, relationship, also on marmots and bears. A lot of really good research has gone on up in the Klawani. Um, but these numbers are quite different, aren't they? They start with zero, I should put this in red, sorry, zero to nine. And that's what you would expect because the lynx is uh, probably the secondary consumer in this case. It's higher up on the trophic level, so there will be fewer lynx. So if you just were to look at the graph and think, what is causing that? you would probably immediately think lynx because as the hairs go up, the lynx go up. And as the hairs go down, the lynx seem to go down. They do seem to be following the trend of the hairs. Um, but there's different reasons for that. Hair cycles, they could be due to winter food shortage. Um, there was experiments over 20 years and in spite of food sources, so I don't know exactly how they did these experiments, but I imagine they were exclusion experiments where resources were made more available or less available. Um, it turned out that the population fluctuated anyway, regardless of resources. Yeah. So field ecologists also placed, placed radio collars on hares. Um, and then they found them when they had died to determine the cause of death. And it turned out that 90% of the hares were killed by predators and, not, and have not, had not died of starvation. So what is the reason for boom or bust? It could be a top-down effect by the lynx or a bottom-up effect by food resources.
So that, how are we doing for time? Only 537. OK, well, let's carry on then. So these boomer bust cycles, they're influenced by probably quite complex interactions between biotic and abiotic factors. OK, I didn't think we'd have time, but I think we do. We'll, we'll look at human population growth. Uh, no, no population can grow indefinitely. And humans are no exception to that. So I don't know if you, did we show this? I think we did at some point. We showed from space the first picture of the Earth, which shows quite clearly that uh, Earth is finite. We're not part of a metapopulation. Uh, we're, the Earth is not part of a metapopulation if you're looking at the Earth as a whole. Yeah, it's, it's finite and resources are finite. They're finite. Now, in other words, uh, they must be cycled. Nothing new is coming to Earth at this point. <laughs> so the human population has increased, of course, exponentially in the last little while. For a while there, so this is 8,000 BC, uh, it's fairly stable, increasing a little bit, some blips in the population growth, some dips in population growth. Um, here in uh, about, when was that, 1500, 1600s, the plague caused a dip. But since the Industrial Revolution and the advent of humans moving around the world, has increased considerably. Now, this is an older graph, so let's move that up to seven. What are we at now? We're not at 8 billion yet, but it's at least 7.5 billion. So really increased a lot, the human population growth. Um, but global population is still growing, but the rate of growth began to slow about 40 years ago. So this shows on the y-axis percentage increase uh, per year. And the rate has declined. The last I have there is 2003. But um, the rate is still declining, the rate of growth. So it's still growing, but it's not growing quite as quickly as it has before. So to maintain stability, a regional human uh, population can exist in two configurations. For zero population growth, uh, there could be high birth rates and high death rates, or a low birth rates and low death rates. So a demographic transition is the move from one toward the other. So this is looking at uh, birth or death rate per 1,000 people. And you can see over time, this is way back, 1750, 2050 is estimated from there. But that this does seem to be occurring. So birth and death rate uh, seems to be going down over time. And that is associated with generally with factors in uh, different factors in developed and developing countries. So in developed countries, there tends to be uh, lower death rate and lower birth rates. And in developing countries, there tends to be higher birth rates and higher death rates. Nevertheless, the, the uh, birth rate and survival has outweighed uh, death rate and mortality. And that's why the global population is rising so considerably. So age structure is an important demographic factor to try and predict future growth trends. So an age structure is the relative number of individuals at each age. So you'd expect if there are a, a lot of very young individuals, uh, then the future growth rate of the population will be higher. If there are currently a lot of uh, older individuals over reproductive age in a population, you would expect the future population rate to be lower. Um, the maturation of 
humans is about, well, it depends where you are. I think in developing countries, I think it's lower. The time of maturation, in other words, puberty is about 12 or 13, I think. In developing countries, it's a little bit older. But it is at the middle, middle ages, not the very young and not the very old, at which reproduction occurs. So here's the age structure, which is represented in, in pyramids. So it can vary quite a bit. So here is Afghanistan, the United States, and Italy. So here you can see in Afghanistan, there are higher number of individuals at younger ages. In the United States, uh, there's slower growth because there are more individuals at older ages. And in Italy, there's also slower growth, even slower growth than that because of the number of individuals at higher ages and the low number of individuals at young age. So rapid growth is expected in Afghanistan, slow growth in the United States, and even a decline in Italy. So they can predict growth trends and can illuminate some social conditions and help us plan for the future. So infant mortality as well and life expectancy at birth varies considerably. So in developed countries, uh, infant mortality is low. In developing countries, it still tends to be quite high, although it is declining, of course. Um, life expectancy in years is higher in developed countries and lower in developing countries. And so how many humans can the biosphere support? Uh, well, there's lots of estimates of that. Uh, I've, I've seen so many, I, I don't really know. Um, maybe 12 billion, 15 billion. It depends, it actually depends a lot on how the earth is responding to climate change, um, whether there are any really catastrophic events. Um, so we don't really know exactly for sure. Caring, so in other words, what is the caring capacity for humans? I think that's a question mark at the moment. Estimates, uncertain. So there are a lot of humans, of course, and there is a concept known as an ecological footprint concept. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it is how many resources individuals in a population use. So there's six types of productive areas um, in calculating an ecological footprint, uh, six types. of productive areas. Uh, there is arable land that's suitable for crops. Pasture for um, domestic animals. Forest ocean, built up land, and fossil energy land. So this is just, this is one concept called the ecological footprint. And this is one way of expressing an ecological footprint. So here are 13 countries using this method showing the ecological footprint. In other words, how many hectares per person are required? So this is zero hectares and this is 16 hectares. Um, and this is available ecological capacity hectares per person. This is what's available. And this is the footprint. This, so this is what's available. This is the footprint. 
And so there is a correlation between what's available and what is used. That's shown by the best fit line here. And where different countries fall. So the world is sitting about here. Um, India and China are low on the scale there. Sweden, Canada, and Australia seem to be up at about uh, 10, eight or 10 hectares per individual. New Zealand, fairly high. So that gives an idea of how much land is required and what our ecological footprint is. At more than 7 billion people, the world is really an ecological deficit at the moment. But one thing I wanted to mention is that, um, so problems that are identified are overpopulation and overconsumption. So these two can contribute to um, the use of ecological resources. About 25% of the world's population uses about 75% of the world's resources. And those tend to be in your developed countries, Europe, uh, Canada, the United States. So that means that 75% of the population uses 25% of the world's resources. And so I learned this a long time ago in, um, in what was I taking then? Conservation biology, I think. Yeah. And I asked the instructor about, um, I, asked, I asked him why he didn't talk more about this, about 75, sorry, not about that, about this, 25% of the population using 75% of the resources. That's an awful lot. It seemed to me that um, even before overpopulation or population size becomes an issue, the consumption of resources would outweigh that issue already. Of course, both are issues. And developing countries are becoming more developed. But in, in some developing countries, you know, it's like 30, uh, 30 children take up the amount of resources of one child in a developed country. And that's not an exaggeration. Yeah, so um, that's, it's a huge question. How can we approach this issue of overpopulation and overconsumption? Those are, those are big issues, I think. Um, awareness and education are two of our, our biggest tools. And so I'd like to end there and we can have maybe a short discussion. Thanks for watching.